Okay, Daniel chapter 6, let's go there. Dare to be a Daniel. How many know that song? All right, well, it's in our hymn book, but only the chorus. So I printed off the verses. So we're going to sing that for our closing hymn of invitation tonight. Um, Dare to be a Daniel. Daniel chapter 6 tonight is the second part of the message entitled The Prepared Heart. This morning, I hope that you were challenged to think about what Daniel did way back when, when he was just a young person. Many scholars believe that he was probably about 16 or 17 years old when he had that confrontation where he stood up for the Lord. And Daniel was indeed a principled young man. He lived by conviction. He had communion with the Lord. He was committed and certainly he had great courage. Tonight we're going to be looking at the encounter that sometimes uh, is just thought of as happening when he was young, but actually most people believe that Daniel was probably in his 80s. Uh, so I asked this morning, uh, this, or actually Friday night, how many young people are 16, 17, or 18? I'm not going to ask how many of you are in your 80s, but if uh, when you think about this, at a point in time in his life where he has already served Nebuchadnezzar, and now he's working for Cyrus and Darius, notice verse 1, it said, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, verse 2, and over these three presidents, of whom Daniel was first. So tonight we're going to be looking at the life of the prophet Daniel, how he serves as a powerful example of how believers in Almighty God should live their lives by holy standards and convictions while facing ungodly situations. I think the challenge tonight is for you to take the message of the word, and I'm going to do my best to draw some applications, but for you to think about when you're faced with ungodly temptations, what principled convictions and guidelines do you fall back to? And I think it's important to recognize that this is really one of the most important reasons as we think about Daniel's life, how he lived. What he purposed in his heart as a young person continued to guide and direct him in his maturity as a servant of the Lord. And so we're going to notice some things tonight that hopefully will, will help us, okay? So, number one, I want you to see how the trap was set for Daniel. How the trap was set. We'll see how the trap was set, how the trap was sprung, and eventually how the trap was spoiled. And in that, God was glorified through the life of Daniel, okay? The trap is set. So, as we continue to read verse 3, the Bible says, Then this Daniel, I love how it says that, then this Daniel. Well, we know that Daniel was first. He was the princes, that the princes might give accounts unto them. Back in verse 2, the king should have no damage. Um, so it says, then this Daniel. In case you were confused with any other Daniels. But this Daniel. This Daniel. Remember, his name is not Belteshazzar. It's Daniel. Daniel, Jehovah is my judge. He was preferred above the presidents and princes because, what does it say, church? Because an excellent spirit was in him. What does this have to say about the God that he served? See, sometimes we can point to people concerning, you know, when uh, we look at a character, whether it's a, a man or a woman in the Bible, and say, well, be like them. And even this morning I mentioned that we should strive to be like Daniel, but ultimately it's, we should be who God has called us to be, but serve the God who they served with all of our hearts. There was a spirit, there was an attitude, there was something that guided Daniel in his life that was worth noting. The Bible goes on to tell us in verse 3 that the king thought to set him over the whole realm, the whole area that he was governing. It's like Daniel had royal blood, but he had royal character. And just like the Bible tells us that God blessed Potiphar's house because of Joseph, I believe God was blessing Daniel, and that affected everybody else around him. His testimony was pure. His testimony was clean. His testimony made an impact. And God can use you to be a blessing to so many other people. And so as we continue in verse 4, notice what it says. It says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find none occasion nor fault. For as much as he was, love this word, he was what? What does it say, church? He was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Now we might think, well, he was faithful to God, but I believe he was a good worker. I believe that he did his best to honor God. And I believe that he served, even in a pagan empire, the very best that he could. So let's draw a couple of points from each main point when we think about the trap being set. First of all, we've already saw that Daniel was successful. 
He was appointed as the chief of the three governors over the entire kingdom. And, and so he distinguished himself above the others because of his excellent spirit. There was something about him. And I believe that when we fear God and we love God, we'll work to our very best that others can see a difference. They may not understand all the doctrines and everything that we hold to and everything that we believe, but they can see that that person is dedicated. That person is committed. That person wants to do a good job. And that should be our testimony. Now, others may try to besmirch our testimony and make it seem like it's not so. But I find it interesting that all these other guys who are jealous for Daniel's position couldn't find anything wrong with him. as everything to, to, to point to his faithfulness to God and certainly to his job. I'm reminded what it says about Joseph and that his master saw that the Lord was with him and the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his land. And this, of course, was when Joseph worked for Potiphar. He was envied. He was envied. So his faithful character was attested to by his enemies who could make no charge against him. Their plan to defeat him was to find some conflict between the law of God and the law of the land. So verse 5 tells us this, Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. He was faithful in that he was a hard worker, but he was faithful to his God, to the one true God. So in verse 6, the Bible says, Here's the trap being set. Then these presidents and princes assembled together to the king and thus uh, uh, and said thus unto him, King Darius, live forever. All the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days, say of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. It's important to understand that the law of the Medes and Persians established that whoever was king or whoever had rule was like a god. He was the only one that could communicate uh, with the gods. And so this, this thing was not just simply to, to boost Darius's uh, ego, but for them to kind of play into the fact that they, just like the pharaohs, thought themselves to be divine. Now notice what it says in verse 8, everyone. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Wherefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. So it gets us to think about this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 15, when we think about our testimony, when we think about how God desires for us to live, I'm reminded what Paul says to the church at Philippi. He says, that ye, ye as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of what kind of nation? A crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So what were they trying to gain here by damaging Daniel's testimony. Well, they wanted him out of the way. They wanted to be in control. See, man only thinks about what he can have now. Unsaved man does. And so Daniel is on the receiving end of their plot, unaware of that. But God was aware of it, and God would protect Daniel because Daniel continued to do what he, he had always done. And so when we think about how Daniel was targeted, Daniel's enemies proposed a royal statute to King Darius that violates or violated Daniel's right to pray and to worship. Notice again in verse 7, this decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for how long? For 30 days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. This was a pretty serious, serious thing. But king Darius signed it. He felt like this was a, a good thing. So the law was signed and was punishable by death if it was violated. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, when Peter was writing to the church that's being persecuted, he says this, For so is the will of God. What pleases God? And what honors God? This is what pleases and honors God. That with well-doing, that means holy living, you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And that leads us to the next thought. So not only was the trap set, but the, the trap is sprung. 
And here it goes into, into it. Now, we know how the story goes, right? We're very familiar with this. Sometimes even people that aren't saved yet have a good understanding of how Daniel in the lion's den goes. But notice what it says in verse 10. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he said, well, it's only 30 days. Is that what he said? <laughs> was he thinking that there could have been a way to get around this? Notice what the Bible records for us. And by the way, the Bible gives us all the information that God wants us to know. So it's very easy for us to sit around here and speculate and to surmise and all these other things. But the Bible says, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened into the chamber towards, in his chamber towards Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day. And what? What did he do? He violated the law. He prayed. He did that which was right according to the law. So even though the, the trap is sprung, we're going to notice here that Daniel continued to pray. And where did this flow from? Did he not care for the man that he worked for? I'm sure he did. He was faithful. He was obedient. But notice what it says in verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Why didn't Dave, Daniel just close the windows? Why didn't he just do this privately? Was he knowing that he was going to get in trouble, being antagonistic? No, I think he just continued to do what he always did because he wasn't doing anything wrong. It's interesting, a couple thoughts here. Knowing full well that the decree had been signed, Daniel did not alter his prayer routine at all. And I love this. It doesn't matter how many times I've read this, hundreds of times, and maybe you have as well. We're encouraged to think about that it's always right to obey God. It's always right to obey God. See, his steadfastness was a testimony to his commitment to the Lord, despite the punishment of death. This was severe. This was extreme. Was it worth it? Well, the, the trap had been set specifically for Daniel. But notice verse 12. Then they came. Who, who did? These men, these conniving conspirators, came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of, of any god or man within 30 days, save of, thee, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Verse 13. Then answered they and said before the king that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. When we think about Daniel continuing to pray, I'm reminded of what it says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29, concerning the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, then Peter and other, the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. I know you're telling us to do something that you think we should do. This is not what's right. And so as we see that Daniel was caught here, verse 15 tells us, or verse 14 says, that then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to do what? To deliver him. He realized that perhaps he had been deceived, realized that this was not a good law in a sense that it violated perhaps others who held to different religions, but especially Daniel, who was his best worker, who was the one that he really thought that he could set him over the entire nation and rule the empire. So notice verse 14 says that he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. You know, when we think about after Daniel's enemies caught him praying, they reported him to the king, yet Daniel was not deterred. The king was forced to abide by his own decree, though he tried with all of his heart to release him. Notice again, he says, he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Can you imagine this? I mean, he's like a god. He is, you know, the, the ruler. He's the king, but he can't undo the law that he signed. That's why several times it says, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. You can't change it. He realized that. How could he get Daniel out of this situation? Surely he had sentenced to death someone that he cared for, someone that was innocent in a sense of the very fact that he was a good person. So I, I think about this. Daniel was punished. How so? Well, the king was hopeful that Daniel's God would deliver him. And we notice this in verse 15. 
Then these men assembled unto the king and said, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. Does it have a question mark at the end of that? You know, there was hope that Darius had for him. But I wonder sometimes if we're presenting the God that we love, the God that we serve to others in, in such a way that they could see that we are indeed faithful to this God, that this God is the God that we believe can do all things. Darius says this to him, he will deliver thee. So the den was closed and sealed with the signet ring of the king, ensuring that the purpose concerning Daniel would not be changed. So notice verse 17, the stone was brought, laid upon the mouth of the den, the king sealed it with his own signet, a special type of ring that would have made it so that nothing could be changed. There's nothing that could be done to undo this. And notice what it says, and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And we read this, and even for people that may not have read it, at the very end, we wonder, how is God going to deliver him from this? Surely, going into the mouth, to the den of, of lions who are probably only fed uh, once in a while, so they would be hungry and ready to tear apart this servant of the Lord. This would be the end of Daniel. So notice we see here then how the trap is spoiled. And I love when we read this because it's not necessarily only talking about Daniel's faithfulness, though Daniel was a faithful man, but the power of God. And that's the thing that we need to recognize when we study passages of Scripture that are pointing to people and the great God that they served. Yes, it is God honoring their faithfulness and their commitment and their courage and their loyalty, but God strengthening them. Notice in verse 18, then the king went to his palace and he passed the night fasting. He couldn't be consoled with food. He could be consoled with music. Nothing could help him rest. He could not sleep because he knew, he knew what was going to happen, even though he claimed that God would deliver him. And so we see that Darius was worried. Darius' night was restless. His concern for Daniel was evident. He rose up early in the morning. He ran to the den, cried out to Daniel with a, with a lamenting voice, wondering if God had delivered Daniel. So we get to verse 19. It says the king rose very early in the morning, went in haste unto the den of lions. What kind of faith did he have? Was it faith in Jehovah God? Was it faith that God had delivered him, where well, there was some hope that he had based upon the fact that Daniel seemed to be a sincere, devoted follower. And if there's anybody that could have survived, it would have been Daniel. So verse 20 says, And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said, Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually able to deliver thee from the lion's and I wonder if Darius had the shock of his life in this answer. And verse 21, never gets old. Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. Did he somehow avoid the lions? Did he find a place perched up in a place that the lions couldn't get to him? Um, was there something else that he did to defend himself from these hungry lions? Well, we know that Darius was worried, but Daniel was delivered. And really, who delivered Daniel? Who delivered Daniel? Daniel answered and said, oh, oh king, live forever. But he, he testified to the greatness of the one true God. So notice what he says in verse 22. He gives the, the details. Well, what happened? He says, my God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt? You know, the law that was established was wrong. And God saw that I didn't do anything wrong. And God protected me. God watched over me. And God helped me that. Notice what it says in verse 23. The king was exceedingly glad for him. And commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den. And no manner of hurt was found upon him. Because he believed in his God. And so what do we point to? We point to the greatness of God. We point to the magnitude of the way in which God is able to deliver. King Darius and all the others witnessed a miracle on behalf of Almighty God's faithful servant. 
This is what it points to, the greatness of God. I love what it says in Psalm 7. This is King David. Uh, actually, you know what? Let's all go there. Let's go to Psalm 7 for a moment. Um, who authored this? Psalm 7. Psalm 7 reads in verse 1, O Lord my God, in thee do I put my trust. Save me from all them that persecute me and deliver me, lest he tear my soul like a lion, rending it in pieces while there is none to deliver thee. O Lord my God, if I have done this, if there be any iniquity in my hands, if I have rewarded evil unto him that was at peace with me, yea, I have delivered him without cause as mine enemy. And he goes on and talks a little bit about that. But here's what's awesome to think about from this particular psalm. It says in verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness and will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. You know, sometimes we wonder the interactions that take place in certain narratives, like with Daniel. I mean, Daniel spent the entire night with hungry lions. How many were there? We have no idea. Does it? Is it fair to say there was more than one because it was the mouth of lions? So it's two, three, five, ten. The whole point was is that when everybody expected this to be a death sentence, it was not. But Daniel doesn't say, well, I was just lucky. It just happened to go that way. The immediate praise is given to God because Daniel knew what happened. Now, some people have asked me what it would be like to see an angel. I don't know if anybody has ever talked to you about that. I had some interesting questions that have come my way over the years in teaching and ministering with kids. And so it's interesting. Sometimes people encounter angels and they're extremely frightened. Even John in his vision sees this mighty angel. And what does he immediately do? He falls down and starts to worship him. The angel says, get up. Only God is to be worshiped. And there's other times when angels appear and It seems like people are having a normal conversation with them. Maybe they're appearing as if they were just a normal person rather than what we tend to think of some glowing being. But the point is is that Daniel, as we go back to Daniel chapter 6, points to the greatness of God, explains what exactly took place, and is able to show what great and mighty things God had done. So that leads us to think about this, that eventually the enemies who plotted for the destruction of Daniel were destroyed. We see here that, as often happens, those who set the trap get caught in it. And that's why even with Psalm 7, it talks about that a little bit. But let's think about this. King Darius ordered the men and their families to be punished in the same manner Daniel was. That's what happened. As we continue reading, we see that in verse 24, um, that the king commanded and they brought those men which had accused Daniel... They cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, their wives, and the lions had, uh, it says, had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or ever they came at the bottom of the den. So the Bible is telling us very clearly what happened <clears throat> and without holding back. And that is the result of messing with God's anointed. But here's something else that I want us to point, to point out tonight. And it's in verse 25. So we think about the purposed heart. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would obey God, that he was going to follow God, that he was going to continue to pray. But ultimately, here's what we see. The point of this message and the point really of this narrative is to see that God was ultimately exalted. That God was exalted. So we see this in verse 25. Then King Darius wrote unto all the people and nations and languages that dwell in the, um, in the earth. And it says here, peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree. Now here's the king. He's making a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men tremble and fear before the God of who? Who's God, church? The God of Daniel. You got to remember, see, we sometimes read the Bible from a 21st century American perspective, and that's not necessarily our fault. That's just kind of what we do. And even though sometimes we're able to sort of understand what it might have been like in those days, I mean, people had so many gods, so many different gods. They had a God for this and a God for that. You prayed to this God or that God. And we see here that Daniel served the one true God. And he was faithful to our God, the God of creation, the God of life, the Father who gives all things. And so this decree is amazing. 
Because in this exaltation, notice what he says about God. And it's interesting, the decree of King Darius to all the world acknowledged what Daniel truly knew, that Almighty God is living, steadfast, powerful, and is the King of kings. Look what Darius says about Daniel's God in verse 26. He says, he is the living God. He's not a dead God. He is steadfast forever. His kingdom that which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall be even unto the end. For a king like this to make that kind of statement, who many of them would have already considered themselves to be gods themselves, this was amazing. Some people have thought perhaps he was just emotional, the very fact that his friend was still alive. So he was making this decree kind of out of an emotional exuberance. But I see him recognizing, what, like I said, what Daniel already knew. And Daniel was probably standing there next to his friend going, you're right, absolutely. Amen to that. He is the living God. He is the steadfast God. He is the powerful ruler. He is the king of kings. Notice verse 27. He delivereth and rescueth. He worketh signs and wonders. That's another way of saying miracles in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Remember, this is a decree. This would be sent forth for everyone to read about. The one man who worshipped the one true God, who really was kind of forced into this situation, not really having a whole lot of his own freedom, but yet God was exalted. Daniel's God is the one true God. <clears throat> I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 8. As Paul was talking about those that had struggled with about eating meat and so forth, he says, but to us there is but, how many gods, church? There is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ by whom, we, by whom are all things, and we by him. What we see here at the very end is that God honored the faithfulness of Daniel. And notice what it says here that Daniel would prosper. God was exalted and Daniel would prosper. What do I mean by that? Daniel, though not living in his homeland with his people, would find favor and blessing by two mighty rulers. And notice what it says here in verse 28. So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And God continued to guide and direct Daniel in his life. So when we think about this, he continued to faithfully serve Almighty God. I wonder if we could kind of like go back in time a little bit, even go back to this morning's message and think about what we read concerning Daniel doing something. He purposed in his heart that he would serve God. He made this his guiding principle in his life. He said that I'm going to serve the Lord. And maybe in an area that we might consider to be all right, well, he just was you know, pretty particular about what he was going to eat. But, but as I said this morning, and I'll say again, I think it was far greater than just the preference of what he was going to be eating. He was following God's commands. Therefore, by doing that, he was not sinning. But do you see how this carried through in his life in many other ways? Like the way in which he was not willing to obey a law that went against what he wor or who he worshipped, and what was his normal worship routine. And I wonder, by way of application tonight, when we think about this, in Psalm 84, verse 5, at the very beginning of the sermon series, On a Heart for God, we actually looked at Psalm 84, and we studied that psalm. Verse 5 in particular says this, blessed. What's, a, what's another word for blessed? Think about Daniel prospering, Daniel being in the position, but what's another way of describing the word blessed? Okay, somebody? Happy, yeah. God's favor upon you. So he says, blessed is the man whose strength is in thee. Daniel was courage, he was, had courage, he was committed, he, he, he uh, has, had convictions. And then notice what it says here. In whose hearts are the ways of of them. Now sometimes you read that and you pull a verse out of the out of the psalm or out of context, you might wonder, well, what is this talking about? What ways of them? The ways of God. The ways of God. See, I wonder sometimes if we're if we if we ever fall into this trap, even as Christians, that we think that we can kind of do our own thing and yet have God's blessing upon our lives. That's not how it works. God honors 
the faithfulness of his people. And especially when we think about the importance of wanting to be blessed and wanting to, 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 to serve God faithfully and to, and to truly prove that we're thankful for our salvation and thankful for all the things that God gives to us, in whose heart are the ways of then. So we think about the purpose that Daniel had all the way back as a young person, as a teenager, that carried him through and the different encounters that he had. So at the very beginning of this message tonight, I said, how are we going to see or what are we going to see and ways in which when we're confronted with very difficult or challenging um, environments or perhaps even temptations to, to uh, give in to the pressures of whatever it may be, will we do the right thing? Will we uh, obey and honor God? I believe God desires greatly for us to obey him more than anything else. So let's think about ways in which that could be, could be true in our lives tonight. Ways in which that could be true in our lives tonight. We, some people might even view this passage of Scripture to say that there are times in which we are to disobey the civil laws or, or whatever it may be when there are things that violate God. And to that I say, yes, there are. We praise the Lord for our country at this point in time. We feel like we have the freedoms where... Uh, our freedom to assemble, to worship, to pray, or not be infringed upon. But what if they did? And that's just speaking as an American now. What about many of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world who perhaps live in countries where it is illegal to worship or to pray openly, like what Daniel was forced to face with this decree that was signed by King Darius? So when we think about this, are there times in which we need to obey God or not times? Or should we always obey God rather than man? The answer is yes. But maybe there's other times in your life when you can think about ways in which you're not exactly, um, maybe we're struggling a little bit with what it means to live out our, our faith when we feel the pressure not to. Times in which maybe our testimony feels a little shaken. Maybe it's situations at work. Maybe it's around certain people where the confidence that we have maybe to express our faith or to talk a little bit more about our God may be lacking there. Perhaps there's some others there as well. But I, I'm very much encouraged by Daniel and this particular account that we've read for a couple of reasons. I want to share those with you. Number one, we see that Daniel was firm in his belief, and it wasn't just something that he talked about. He lived it out. And this should be our lives, that we live out our faith, and that we're saying, this is something that we believe in. We go back to verse 3, and what did Daniel have? Daniel had an excellent spirit. So therefore, he was somebody that was faithful, not in some areas, but in all areas. So therefore, as a result of this, he was committed, and he showed that. So he lived out his faith. Number two, he was willing to take the punishment for things that violated what he knew to be right and true. And while sometimes a direct correlation or application of this particular uh, a biblical account may be difficult because of the great freedoms that we have currently in our country, but we could still look at this and say, when we're being told to do something that, that we know is right and good, will we stand up for the truth? Uh, we have missionaries in Canada, two in particular. How many of you know, remember the Russo family? The Russo family. Well, Quebec is much different than even other parts of Canada. And Jean, I follow him on Facebook, and of course, he's doing it in French. I'm, I'm trying to read his subtitles as much as I can when he put, posts videos. But it is criminal, criminal, to even mention anything against the sin of homosexuality. I mean, I don't know how many people are following that. That was like big news in 2012. But it's got way worse. Now, as Christians, I don't think we go out of our way to target someone to, to make them feel bad about the sin that they are committing, whether they think it's just perfectly fine. I don't think that's necessarily the, the biblical approach of winning someone to Christ. But the point is, is that when we clearly preach or teach what the Bible is saying, we are not violating uh, God's law, but it might be man's law. And so he's written about some of those struggles that he has faced with even the, the threat of closing down his church. So Daniel had an excellent spirit. His faith was real. Daniel was willing to suffer the consequences. But what else about Daniel? Daniel was also 
trusting that God would deliver him. It's amazing when we look at what, what King Darius said about him in verse 16. Again, would you look there again? It's Darius' uh, statement of, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. He didn't question it. He kind of said it almost like it's a statement. But you wonder, did Darius have any kind of real faith? But perhaps he saw something in Daniel that pointed to the fact that Daniel truly believed. And, and this is the kind of testimony that I hope that we can have that we can make an impact in the lives of others. We want them to understand what it means to have the blessings that we have, to believe in the one true God and have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and to serve him. That others, it obviously is going to be more than just observing us, that we need to uh, preach the gospel, we need to share our faith. But sometimes from a distance, people observe us. Our neighbors that we may not talk to all the time, but they see us regularly going to church or ministering or helping with others. Maybe the way in which we do interact with our neighbors, perhaps our coworkers and how we respond to them, or maybe they learn about situations that we're dealing with that uh, maybe we don't even know that they know, uh, uh, that, or maybe the, you know, they're not aware that we're aware that they know or whatever. So the point is, is all these different situations that you may be experiencing, all these things are testimonies of God so that you can have a strong testimony, so that when God does deliver you, when God does show his hand of blessing upon you, when God chooses to use you in a great and mighty way, God ultimately is exalted because of that. That's what we see happening in the life of Daniel. Daniel was a person who had a principled and purposed heart. He determined to do what was right and was willing to face even very you know, harmful uh, consequences for it, but because he loved God, he was able to faithfully serve him.